All right. Good evening to everybody. Again, good evening to all of those who you are on Zoom. Good evening to all those who are going to be joining us via YouTube. Praise God for your presence on tonight as we engage in our Tuesday night Bible study here at Christ Baptist Church. And we are studying the spiritual disciplines. And tonight we're studying the spiritual discipline of study. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, blessing us today, blessing us with everything that we needed, everything um, that we could possibly meet, God, you made sure that we had, and for that, we're grateful and thankful. We're thankful tonight for this opportunity to engage in studying your word. Thank you, God, for all those who are on the Zoom tonight. Thank you for their faithfulness and commitment to studying the Bible. As we know, uh, you have called for all of us to study to show ourselves approved unto you, workmen who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, God, we just pray even now that if there's anything that's going to distract us or hinder us from learning tonight, we pray, God, that you would remove it. We pray, God, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, that we might receive what it is that you would say to us tonight. Holy Spirit, speak to us and lead us through the study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's see here. All right, so <clears throat> again, thank you all for for um, choosing Bible study over football. Praise God. But um, tonight we want to start, um, uh, finish our study. I'm not finished, but um, get into our study on study. And um, I, I know we talked last week about, um, last week we talked about um, looking at some different Bible scriptures in order to um, break them down and kind of get a, um an idea of how to to study and and i do want to do that still but but the lord kind of just laid on my heart that um it's probably important to do some other stuff before we get to that and so i, I wanted to you know i didn't want to take it for granted i know that uh christ baptist has <clears throat> traditionally been a you know a church that studies that studies the bible we have uh tons of opportunities for people to study and and uh, learn the bible i know i got some bible scholars here i got some bible scholars even on the call some some who've been to bible school and things of that nature but I didn't want to take it for granted that everybody understands some of the basic things that we get from the Bible. And so I wanted to take that opportunity tonight and uh, share some of those things, because it's important before we start studying the Bible that we have, you know, at least an overview, if you will, of the Bible and understand, you know, uh, some things about the Bible in terms of, you know, you know, basic information. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I want to want to invite everybody to, to real quickly, if, if you haven't already done so, to grab a pen and pencil get your pen and pencil i'm gonna go real slow with this stuff tonight so that you can so you can write it down i want you to have this information for your information i want to make sure that you have all of these things so that you can you can use them as a reference you can use them when you're studying the bible um and some of these things may help you understand some of the things that you don't understand about the bible if you have this kind of basic bible information background information that i'm going to give you on tonight and then next week next week we will conclude um this study on the bible I mean, I mean, this uh, study on this discipline on study and uh, we'll go into the uh, start getting into what is called the outward, um, the outward disciplines, um, the outward disciplines. They, they deal with uh, things that are, are basically on the outside, if you will, of us um, on the outside of our lives. And, and the, the first one, the first one that we're going to deal with is the discipline of simplicity, simplicity. Uh, what it means to have a simple life and um, and, and how God has, has created things. Simple. So we'll get into that uh, in two weeks. Uh, next week, we'll finish up um, study. And then after that, after the, um, I think that's the new year, after the new year, uh, we will begin the study on simplicity, um, the outward disciplines. So, so again, tonight, I wanted to just, I wanted to make sure that we had some basic uh, Bible information that I wanted to give everybody and make sure that you understand some of the basic things about the Bible um, so that when you begin to study, um, some things, you know, will make sense to you and you'll have some some sort of background information that you can pull from that, that helps you understand it. So again, hope everybody got their pen and pencil and you're ready to write. I'll leave screens up. Um, you, you, you feel free to, to, I can't see your face cause I got this, um, this PowerPoint up. So feel free to unmute yourself and tell me to slow down or tell me to stop or tell me don't, don't, or go back to a screen, things of that nature so that you can get this. I want to make sure you get this. That's, that's what's most important. So don't, don't be afraid to interrupt me if I move and you haven't gotten everything you needed. So <clears throat> Bible basic information, um, uh, the Bible of course, 
uh, was written in two different languages originally. Um, <clears throat> when God spoke to all of these people who wrote who wrote these books, um, there was there was two languages that that they were written in um, the Old Testament, primarily in Hebrew or Aramaic and the New Testament, primarily in Greek. Those writers, <clears throat> uh, those those languages pretty much dominated, if you will, or, or was the predominant, I should say, uh, language of um, those times. And so <clears throat> that's what the when those books were written, that's what the language that they were written in. And um, <clears throat> It's important. It's important to understand and know that because, uh, for for one, the both of those languages, Hebrew and Greek, are what uh, are what is considered dead languages. In other words, um, there are nobody. There's nobody left who who is from those cultures who speak those languages fluently, or if you will. There's just like I would. It would almost be to say that. Um, um, everybody who who learned how to speak English, who was raised and speaking English and things of that nature, has died off now, and there's nobody left to speak English, and so it's just a language that uh, you got uh, people who who've never lived in that lived in that uh, era or that time or in that in that group of people um, would have to would have to try to learn it in some way or try to uh, uh, figure out what was being said or anything like that. So uh, they're basically dead languages, and so that that presents you know some challenges that presented presented some challenges, more especially for, for those who were translators of the Bible. Uh, but we'll get into that later. But um, again, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, uh, the New Testament written in Greek. Uh, <clears throat> there are, of course, um, everybody should know this. We should, we should know this since we were children. 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. The, the, uh, <clears throat> the Old Testament is divided into five parts. The first part was considered the law or the Pentateuch, and that was that consists of the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> that was considered the, the Pentateuch, the law, the first five books of the Bible. It pretty much give you um, a, a glimpse of, of God's interaction with humanity and how he's establishing law, which is really to help establish uh, uh, the culture um, of his people. Not giving them law and giving them things that that they should do, uh, rules and if, if you will establishing civilization, uh, the law was was important for that. The law is important for any establishment of civilization, so that people know how to govern themselves and how to live the, live within that culture culture or context. And so uh, the, the those five those first five first five books are are um, critical in helping uh, God's people uh, learn how to live. Um, and live their lives according to his will and as his people. So the first five books were considered the law, the Pentateuch. Then there were um, the other the other part, uh, the second part of the Old Testament was considered the historical books. Um, and there's 12 of those books from Joshua to Esther. 12 historical books from Joshua to Esther. Then we have uh, the poetry books. Uh, books that 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 um, really are poetry and 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 uh, some of the books that that uh, really bless us and and help help pretty much uh, um, uh, meet us where we are in terms of our emotions in terms of our feelings in terms of our interactions with each other uh, our interactions with God rather more especially with God but our poetry books um, or five poetry books and they're from Job to Songs of Solomon then we have the major prophets. There's five major prophets from Isaiah to Daniel, and then there's 12 minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi. So those are five different parts of the Old Testament. Um, the, the Old Testament is divided up into five parts, the law, the historical books, the poetry books, the major prophets, the minor prophets. <clears throat> All right, so then, um, then we have the, the New Testament. And of course, the New Testament begins off with the four gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, <clears throat> now, the four Gospels are called synoptic Gospels. Um, and the reason why they're called synoptic Gospels is mainly because their information is similar, very similar in nature. Um, although John's Gospel has a vastly different, uh, is vastly different in detail and in um, the different timelines of events. Um, but, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
are very similar in terms of their information and in terms of their timelines. Um, now, now one might ask, uh, well, how how did they all get this information? How did that you know how did that how did they all get the information? How did how did they get it together? How did it, how is it so similar in in nature to each other? Uh, well, well, what we what we find in terms of um, research and and based off of you know scholar work and people who 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 have done the scholarly work or what they suggest is, is that Matthew and Luke uh, pretty much got their information to write their gospels from Mark's gospel and another source, which is called Q. So, so in other words, uh, Mark, um, <clears throat> Mark, uh, um, uh, Matthew and Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke uh, took Mark and this other source called Q and pretty much wrote their gospels based off of what they got from Mark and this 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 uh, other source called Q. Now now Q stands for quell, which is really a German word for source. And and basically what but what what the Q is is that uh, it was another source that that many believe is is just no longer able was not found. It's it's gone. It's it's not um it's it's not in anywhere to be found. But um uh, there there's there's um proof and 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 through through proof and through uh, through um, again research to show that Matthew and Luke um, had two sources of information to write their gospels. Now, um, other others others would suggest that you know that this Q source uh, could have been could have been another book. Uh, others suggest that the Q source could have been other people. We know that that Luke had a relationship with with uh, Peter. Uh, so, so he could have gotten his information from Peter as well, while he's matching it up against Mark's book. And so, you know, again, we never really know um, the 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 true details of it. But what what is most important is is that their information does line up with each other. So, therefore, um, uh, we have more than one witness about the life and 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 the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, let me pause right there for one second and and um, address what a lot of people have asked me over the years about the, the gospels and about the Bible period is how did the Bible come together? You know, how, how, how was the Bible, what they call canonized? In other words, group, um, grouped together in terms of um, creating the 66 books of the Bible. How, how did that happen? Well, the old Testament is pretty simple. Um, even, even those who lived in the new Testament had the books of the, of the old Testament. As a matter of fact, Whenever you see in the New Testament, they refer to Scripture. They're referring to the Old Testament. They had the Old Testament. Um, they they didn't even realize that they were living out what we know now as the New Testament. Those who were in the New Testament, so uh, they had the Old Testament already um, in their possession. They read it. Um, you you see many instances where where Jesus would go into the temple every week and read from the um, the scrolls or the law or from the prophets, things of that nature. You've seen Jesus do that on a regular basis. And you've seen others um, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, 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 the uh, Sanhedrin Council, if you will, who would, who would also teach uh, from, from the Old Testament books. So that was already in place. Now, now, as it relates to the New Testament, you know, that's the big question. How did the New Testament come into existence? And, you know, how, how was that formed? You know, how did uh, who who made that decision? You know who made the decision. And so, but uh, what we learned is is that 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 there were there were a lot of books written, right? There was a lot of letters written about <clears throat> about the times of Jesus and uh, what was going on in those times. And um, a lot of people wrote them. A lot of people had uh, things that they wanted to say about you know what was going on in those days. And so, out of all of these books that were written. Um, those who were responsible for trying to canonize or bring together or put together what was to be the New Testament, here's what they wanted to do. Um, they wanted to make sure that the, that the books or, or the letters that were included in the New Testament were, were written by somebody who either uh, walked with Jesus or somebody who, um, who knew or, or had relationship with somebody who walked with Jesus? Or somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who walked with Jesus, but lived in that time. And I'm sure, I'm sure as you as you think about that, that's that's important. And, and we're probably glad that they that that um God laid on their heart to do that because if if 
if if we want to if we want to uh, uh, present a gospel message or or a message of the Bible, you know that that is that we say is is the word of God, then we better make sure that whoever wrote it is somebody who had firsthand knowledge or 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 was right near it or was 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 living in that time or was or was with somebody who had firsthand knowledge. And so that's that's pretty much how they came up with these with these um, with these gospels that um, or these books. I'm sorry that was written or that was included in the New Testament, uh, which is why you know when we talk about this source Q, uh, a lot of scholars would suggest like somebody like Luke. Luke is Luke was a was in relationship with Peter. Um, Luke was a part of the church in his in his book, the book of Acts. He wrote. I, I was going to share that in a minute, but uh, Luke wrote. Um, uh, Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. Um, he was he was referring to himself in the book of Acts as being there, as if he was there watching these things, seeing these things as the church, you know, um, as he describes what was going on in the church and things of that nature. And so, you know, um, that would be considered um, he's somebody you would consider as an accurate source because they were there. And and what he what he wasn't there to witness in terms of the life of Jesus, um, he he was in relationship with people who were like Peter and others. So that's important to know. Um, make sure you make sure you put a, put a, uh, make a note of that that the, that the Bible, um, the books that's in the New Testament were were chosen as a result of um, people who either walk with Jesus like John, or people who um, who uh, um, knew somebody who did walk with Jesus, or or or, or that person gave uh, the person who walked with Jesus gave them firsthand knowledge about. Um, about that, and even even people, even scholars suggest that that John may have not have written the book himself, but he had somebody pen it for him and things of that nature. But yet, yet and still, it's still his message or his his witness, if you will, of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So after the, after the after the the Gospels, of course, we have the Book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts is, of course, the history of the church, uh, gives the, the beginning history of the church, at least the first 30 years of the history of the church. And again, is written by Luke, who also wrote the gospel of Luke. And again, it was as if Luke had wrote two books, uh, one book rather that was divided into two parts. One talked about the life of Jesus and how Jesus, you know, what Jesus did while he was on earth. And then <clears throat> the book of Acts talked about what happened after Jesus ascended back into heaven. As a matter of fact, if you look at the book of Acts in chapter one, he picks up in chapter one, um, Jesus uh, appearing to the disciples after he had been um, raised from the dead and uh, even even <clears throat> even carries on his storyline after Jesus ascends back into heaven. And but before he ascends back into heaven, he gives them instructions to go into the upper room and wait, told him, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea, to the utmost parts of the world, tells him to go into the upper room and wait for my spirit that will come and descend on you and empower you to, to be those witnesses. And, and then, so um, from Acts chapter two, the birth of the church and Pentecost on the day of Pentecost and so forth and so on for the, for the next 30 years, he records what he had seen um, and how the church had been, uh, how the church had been founded and how the church prospered and grew even to the point where he uses language that the church, uh, that the apostles or the, 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 the disciples or the church, if you will, flip the world upside down, change the world altogether um, as a result of them spreading the good news, the message of Jesus Christ. And we know that to be true because we know that we are recipients of their work that they carried on. Um, and, and we are part of that 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 group that Jesus says, they shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so we are recipients of that ourselves. We were to them the uttermost parts of the world. Um, and we received the gospel and thank God for that. All right, so so after after Luke, um, after Luke wrote Acts and then we have all the epistles and the epistles were written to individuals and some were written to churches and the authors were Paul, uh, James, <clears throat> the brother of Jesus, Peter, his disciple, John and Jude. And then we have, of course, the book of Revelations that, that ends the Bible. And the book of Revelations is considered to be a eschatological book. And eschatological or eschat eschatological basically means end times. It was a book of prophecy about what would happen in the end times. Once, make sure you make a note of that. Um, Revelations is an eschatological book. I want you to, want you to learn that word too. We're going we to learn some words here. 
um, and, and expand our expand our uh, our dictionary. <laughs> Um, but eschatological, eschatological, it means end times, the end of times, what's going to happen at the end of times. And that's what the book of Revelation is. It was a book that was written as a, pro a prophetic book to talk about what's going to happen at the end of time. All right. So um, hopefully y'all got all that information. Um now I, I want I want us to be on on caution that that there there were again the, the the books of the Bible were written in the original languages I mean in the in the languages of those days in the Old Testament Hebrew Aramaic and the New Testament Greek um, there were millions of attempts to translate the Bible from the original language into the languages of all the different on all the different languages in the world. Um, and so that, that was that, that's important to note because <clears throat> again it's difficult as i said earlier it was difficult to try to take something that was written in a dead language and you have you have nobody excuse me you have nobody left living that would that would be able to like you know interpret it for you to to help you understand it or you know to help you know what it means you know to translate it for you there was just nobody uh, there's nobody alive that still speaks those languages. And so it became very difficult to, uh, to do that. And so again, we have millions and millions and millions and millions of translations from the original language of the Bible into the languages of the world. And, and you know, having said that, um, uh, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's two words that are commonly used referring to the Bible and, 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 and depend on you know, what side of the aisle you on, you know, depending on what, you know, in some cases with preachers, depending on what seminary you went to, uh, depending on, you know, what your belief system is, what you believe. Uh, there are some who believe that the Bible to, in its totality is inerrant, which means that it's without errors. You see that word there, inerrant. And then also some who believe that the Bible is infallible, which means there is no faults in the Bible. There's no errors and there's no faults. Um, some some believe that the that the Bible that you currently have right now, no matter what translation you has you have, there are no errors and there are no faults. And and of course, you know some modern day church folk and scholars, you know, use these terms to to refer to present day translations. Now, <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm not I'm not here to to persuade you or or convince you of one or the other. I'll just tell you where I stand on it um based on the fact that there have been millions and millions and millions and millions of attempts to translate the bible from hebrew and greek a dead language into you know just into english period um i have a hard time believing that there were no errors or no faults in terms of the the transcribing of it uh with all the different um utensils and tools used to, to to write on, uh, um, you know, and, and, and over and over again and over and over again, all down throughout the years, um, it's kind of hard to to be convinced that there was no errors or any faults in the translations. And even more importantly, even into 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 from one language to another, that there was there was no errors or faults. Now, here's what I do believe. Um, what I do believe is that that the message, the, the, the message of the Bible, the principles of the Bible, the, the major principles of the Bible and God's miraculous power, God was able to sustain those things. And, and those things do not have errors, nor have any faults. I do believe that God's word when he spoke it and it was written by the original writers of the Bible in their original languages, that there were no errors and no faults. And and what has what has passed down throughout the years, um, the the messages, the 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 the, uh, the um, principles, the, the the laws, all of those things have maintained their integrity in terms of um, uh, translating them from what they were how they were originally written to now. Uh, I believe God miraculously preserved the Bible in that in that sense. And if and if not, if 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 it was not preserved, then we would all still be lost because we, we've been saved by these messages. We've been saved by, by what, we've, what we've learned that has been passed down to us. And so in that sense, I believe that, that um, 
the overall the overall um, message of the Bible had no errors, has no errors, and has no faults. Um, is there some wording and maybe some you know errors and words and 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 punctuations and and maybe even some meanings and things of that nature, possibly, but not so much so that it would ever affect the message of the Bible or affect the, what God wanted us to know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's my that's that's just my opinion on it. Um, again, you know, you can you can you can uh, you can uh, side on whichever area you want. It, it to me, it really doesn't even matter. Um, you know whether whether you believe the current Bible in its current form is inerrant or infallible. Um, the the one thing that I know has no errors and has no faults is, is that Jesus uh, came down through forty two generations, was conceived by the Holy Ghost, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, he died and was buried, and on the third day morning he rose with all power in his hands. And he ascended back into heaven where he is now making intercession for us. And soon and very soon, one day, he's going to come again and receive us unto himself. That is the Apostles' Creed. That is the message of the Bible. That is the gospel message. And I don't care. Um, <clears throat> I don't care, you know, uh, what, other, what other things in the Bible maybe have errors or have faults or if they do or they don't. As long as that stays the same, then I know that my, and I believe it, and, and I believe it in my heart. And confess with my mouth, I know that my place in eternity is secure. And for that, that's all that matters. All right. So now <clears throat> um, we talked last week, um, talked last week about um, the different translations of the Bible and things of that nature. And um, I wanted to I wanted to um, get you this information because I think it would be helpful to you as you're studying the Bible, um, as you're as you're you're learning to study the Bible. I think we're going to be out pretty pretty early today. Then that way y'all can still catch the first half of the game since about 70 people decided not to come to Bible study tonight. But I'm putting this on YouTube so they can so that you know they can hear me talking bad about them. So y'all forgive me, okay? I'm I'm just saying this uh so that when they watch it on YouTube, because hopefully them 70 people go back and watch this on YouTube, they can hear the pastor saying, It is a shame that y'all stay home to watch them sorry Eagles play and not be on this Bible study. But anyway, there are there are three different ways uh, or means that translators use to translate the Bible into the language of their country. Um, um, one, one means was called formal equivalence. And, and formal equivalence basically means, I'm, I'm, all right, Deacon Thompson, I'm trying to behave, man. Let me know I'm trying to. <laughs> um, formal equivalence basically means that when they translated it from uh, Hebrew or Greek into English, or to Latin or to to Spanish or whatever the language is, they they looked at the original language and tried to translate it word for word. So so when they when they read, you know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Um, <clears throat> they they tried to translate that word for word, whatever, however you say it in Hebrew. They they tried to put it in English word for word, and that's called former equivalence, word for word. Um, Word for word studies. All right, somebody said they Eagles fan. I don't see your name though. Okay, but thank you for thank you for choosing Bible study over the Eagles. God bless you. Um, so there's formal equivalence, and then there is what's called dynamic equivalence, and and so what they did and and what what dynamic equivalence means is that <clears throat> instead of trying to translate uh, from Hebrew and Greek into English or Latin or Spanish or whatever your French um, word for word. They did it thought for thought. So basically, they looked at a particular scripture or a particular pericope, which is just a, 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 a few verses or so, and and tried to figure out what was the writer thinking when they when they wrote this, and then say what they were thinking um, in the language that um, they were translating the scripture into. So so if the if the writer if the writer was was trying to suggest that that um, um, I'm thinking of um, that God loves you, you know, and 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 there was no there was no correct way or there was no you know good way to say it in English. Then they would just say you know what they thought that God loves you, you know that God loves us, you know things of that nature, you know. So they they pretty much took thought for thought. 
And then, then finally, there was um, the, the final means that they used to translate was paraphrasing. And I'm sure everybody pretty much knows what a paraphrase is, is that um, basically um, you're trying to re rephrase uh, what was said, say it in another way that, that makes it more uh, relevant or makes it more easier to understand. And so you have different translations that fall under um, those headings, um, word for word, thought for thought, and paraphrase. And so I listed them right there so that, you know, um, take, take, a, take, a, take a, a few a minutes, a few minutes or so, and uh, make sure um, you write it down. Make sure you write it down. So we got, we got word for word translations are uh, the New American Standard Bible, the NSAB, the um, Amplified Bible. The ESV is the English Standard Version. The King James Version and the Revised Standard Version. So we talked about that last week as well. When we talk about what is what is the what is the um, what is one of the most accurate uh, <laughs> excuse me uh, um, translations of Scripture, um, a lot of people will will point to the Revised Standard Version, or there's some people who stand on the the, new, the American Standard Bible. Um, but I, I think um, a lot of people will, if you ask scholars and theologians throughout the years, if you read read studies and things like that, you know, what is the most accurate translation of scripture? They, they, they uh, largely point to the RSV. So those are all the word for word translations. Um, then you have the thought for thought translations, which would be the New King James Version, um, the uh, CSB, the new, the new, um, new revised standard version, the new revised standard version, the new in, new English <clears throat> translation. CSB is the Christian Standard Bible. I had to look that up. I forgot what it was. The new revised standard version, the new English translation, um, the NIV, um, which is the new international version, and the NLT, which is the new living translation. Those are considered to be thought for thought translations, um, where where. The, the translator looked at the original language and tried to write or pin what they thought the original language was saying into a thought of um, in the language that they're writing. <clears throat> and then you have, again, you have the paraphrase translations um, and the paraphrase translations are the GNT, which is the good news translation, um, the CEV, which is the contemporary English version, um, the TLB is the Living Bible, and then you have Eugene Peterson, who writes what's called the Message, the Message Bible. Now, for me, for me, in my time of studying the Bible, um, a lot of these versions I use. Um, some I don't use. Um, like I don't use the Good News Translation. I don't use the Living Bible. Uh, but most of the other ones I do use pretty much. <clears throat> so when I'm reading the Bible, especially when I'm studying for a sermon, um, one of the things that I do um, sometime on sometime on Sunday after uh, football or, or after I had a nap or after I ate or something to that effect, when I have some downtime, what, what I do is I try to read, if I, if I know my text for the next week, I try to read the scripture or the text or the chapter or whatever it is in just about all of these translations as I um, – Sometimes in sometimes in multiple multiple times in these translations. And then I try to what I try to do is I try to to look at, you know, especially if I only got a few verses, if I'm only dealing with three or four verses, I'm looking at these different translations to see what's what's the difference. What what's the difference? Where's the wording differences at? You know, what uh is there wording differences and you know, is there thought differences? You know, what is the paraphrasing saying? You know, I do look at Eugene Peterson's message. Bible sometimes it you know it helps me a little bit uh, get some clarity on on um, what I may have read in another translation that I didn't understand possibly um, <clears throat> but but I try to when, when studying the Bible I try to read as many of these translations as possible I probably read a scripture the scripture that I'm preaching from probably a good twenty times or so a week um, twenty times in my initial part of study I mean I read it more than that because I have to keep referring to it but my initial interaction with the text is to read it about twenty times. In all these different translations, so when you read, when you study the Bible, you want to, you know, you want to look at all of these different translations and try and try to pull out what's the differences. What I, what do I see differently here? You know, what's what's different words? Why do they use this word versus this word? And 
you know, and 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 maybe maybe I don't understand why it's using this word, but maybe this version uh, uses another word that kind of gives me an idea of what that other word meant or what they were trying to say. And so it's a, it's a good tool to use when you're studying the Bible is to look at all of these different translations and see how much time we got here. All right. All right. Got about a few minutes here. I want to push on <clears throat> and give you this last piece of information. So um, scholars suggest that the different translations can be hard or easy for persons studying the Bible, basically due to what your academical level of reading is. Now, um, I put this in here because I, I, I just want to be quite honest and transparent. I sometimes this can I find this to be sometimes true that based off of your you know your 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 academic level of reading, um, different translations can be hard. But um, then sometimes I think it's offensive because you know basically what you're saying is, is that um, if you don't have a certain level of uh, a, a certain level of reading that you know you won't be able to comprehend what um, the um, the different um, translations say now, I, you know, the reason why I find it offensive is because uh, that basically kind of X's out or counts out the Holy Spirit's job, which is to to help you understand what you're reading and bring things to your remembrance and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but it's, it's good, to, it's at least good to know that, um, you know, I have an understanding that, that um, especially as we're trying to help others and engage them in studying the Bible, that that one of the reasons why you, you sometimes find it hard for young people to be engaged in Bible study or or to to want to read the Bible or study the Bible, mainly because some of them just don't, they can't, they haven't uh, grown or are mature to the level of reading the Bible um, and reading some of these translations. Um, I, I I have many conversations with with um, young people who say, uh, if, if I'm forced to read the King James, I'm lost. I mean, I even had adults say that I, I, I just don't read it because I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Some just say, well, if I don't understand it, and basically from their from their culture, culture, uh, culture or their context, their church, the, the church tells them that that the King James Version is the only version of the Bible. Uh, well, I can't understand it. I don't, I don't understand how to read it. I don't understand how to, you know, how to how to apply it or, you know, I don't understand what it's saying. Then basically, I just won't read the Bible. I just won't read it at all. Or or I'll just become, um, you know, um, dependent on, you know, somebody else to read for me or study for me. And I just depend on whatever they say, you know, so uh, here, here are here are what some people suggest are the reading levels for the different versions the different translations of the Bible. Um, if if they, they suggest that um, uh, if you're if your reading level is at a high school level, then you'll be able to you'll be able to understand these versions. So 12th grade, it, they, and they're basically they saying that that, that in order to understand the King James Version, you need to have a 12th grade reading level and the Revised Standard Version, a 12th grade reading level. The, the New, New American Standard Bible, 11th grade reading level. And so also for the New Revised Standard Version, 11th grade reading level. And then for the English Standard Version, uh, just a 10th grade reading level. Um, in, in middle school reading levels, they say in order, in order to understand the New Living Translation, um, you, you need a sixth grade reading level, the new King James version, a seventh grade reading level also with the, um, the, um, what was it? The, the contemporary English Bible, uh, seventh grade reading level, and then seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade reading level, the Holman Christian standard Bible and the NIV. And then, um, in order to understand the new international readers version, you just need a third grade reading level to understand, the, um, that and the new century version. And then just a fourth and fifth grade reading level to be able to understand the message, the good news translation and the contemporary English version. So those are some, that's some basic information um, that I wanted to share with you all tonight. Um, it's 742 that I, that hopefully you wrote these things down. Um, this last page again, you know, not really, not really for your information, but more for those of you who, who, who are dealing with Sunday school, your teachers and, your Sunday school teachers, your Bible teachers, and things like that. You want to, you want to be, you want to be cognizant of this and mindful of this. Um, that if you're dealing with, if you're dealing with kids, you know, um, in your classes, you you might not want to read to them the King James version of the Bible because it's likely that they won't understand it. It's like they won't understand it. So you want to, you want to get a translation. You know, if, if you're buying gifts, if you're buying gifts for 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 kids, you know, or, or your family members, um, <clears throat> buying gifts for your kids and your family members, you want to you want to make sure uh, that you know you buy them a Bible. I'm sorry, you want to buy them a Bible for a gift. You want to make sure that you get them a Bible that they can understand. 
that they can that they can read and, and comprehend what's being said. You know, um, um, <clears throat> if you're buying Bibles for, you know, if we buy buying Bibles for people who've been incarcerated and things like that, you don't want to insult them by giving them something like the King James or the Revised Standard Version um, and and they'd be stuck. You know, they'd be stuck not not understanding it, not knowing what they're reading, not being able to comprehend it. But buy them, get them a get them a Bible that that can speak into speak a language for them that they would better understand and and, and know. But as a matter of fact, there was a there was a Bible. Some some of y'all preachers who may be on the line um, uh, might have been aware of this. But but years ago, um, probably about 10, 15 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, somebody came out with a with a with a Bible that was an Ebonics Bible. I mean, it it was it was they rewrote the Bible in Ebonics, like you know, um, in the beginning in the beginning God was chilling and 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 God was God was hovering over the face of the deep and you know Jesus and his homeboys was was on their way to go get something to eat, <laughs> you know, you know stuff like that, you know. It was, uh, you know, I, I didn't I didn't go through it to see just how accurate it was. I wasn't interested back then, you know, um, and, and didn't have the time really. But but it was I, I thought it was interesting that that somebody came up with the idea to write the Bible in Ebonics in order to try to reach people who were in prison and people who um, uh, young people who who pretty much, unfortunately, did not even have an elementary reading level. But but they knew Ebonics. You know, they knew Ebonics. And you know, so I, I don't knock their effort. Um, I just don't know how accurate it was, but you know, just keep that keep that in your back pocket for those of you who, who who um, who look to give Bible gifts. I mean, give the give gifts um, of the Bible to people, or you're looking to teach young people. Be be careful. Don't don't give them something that will turn them off. Don't give them something that's so confusing for them that they say, you know what, uh, it'll it'll you know I, I'm not gonna read this. And then then what will happen is 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 that same Bible you gave them will be just like some of the Bibles that we got when we was younger. It'd be sitting on our our mantle. With all, a whole bunch of dust on it for the next 40 years and the reason why it's, it's sitting there is because nobody opened it because i just didn't understand it didn't understand how to read it all right i'm gonna stop sharing my screen all right hopefully that was that was um helpful information and beneficial information for for those of you who who was tuned in um i want to say thank you again to all those who joining us via youtube Pray that you were blessed by this study. We're looking forward to next week as we as we use some of this information that dolls deeper into some scriptures and texts as we try to 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 get an understanding of, of of what they say and what they mean. And so, until then, to all our YouTube um, viewers, God bless you. Have a great night, and see you next week.